Hey guys, welcome back to Decently Indecent episode 27. As usual, it's a, a, a treasure to have you join me here for a little bit today, and I don't take your time for granted. I do oftentimes get self-conscious in this particular longer form content format, um, and I've maybe spoken about this once before because I'm so programmed from years of making content online to be so hypercritical of every moment to optimize it for, you know, growth and shares and what, you know, all of the things you optimize for when you're trying to find an audience on the internet. So the idea of just completely letting go of that side of myself to just try to speak authentically without worrying how I'm coming across at all times has been uh, incredibly freeing, but also just a little bit nerve wracking, but one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast is because with anything, the more you practice, the easier those things get. So I just want to thank you guys that have, have listened and given me feedback uh, on Storyfire and on YouTube. Uh, I've gotten some really nice con comments just uh, just from some of you guys that listen and appreciate this, this type of content. Um, Haven said, I did an episode last week where I touched on a few different topics, including like depression and a couple of ideas around that. And Haven said, the real depressing thing here is this episode's only 30 minutes long because I could listen to you talk for hours. I was like, well, you know what? That means a lot, my friend. And I do the best I can. I got the nice mic out. I got the nice compression and try to make it sound good <laughs> at the very least. But this is the point. Today, we got a couple of, we got a couple of maybe three fingers of Jameson poured uh, in the glass with the globe decanter as always. Um, it's currently Friday as I'm recording this. So I'm Unwinding a little bit before the weekend. After a long week, I'm going out to do some uh, some glow golf with my wife and another couple tonight. Where <laughs> I've never done this before, but it's basically nighttime golfing with glow in the dark balls. And they set up the course so you can, I guess, see the greens, etc. No idea what to expect. Looking forward to it. Figure I'd get a little bit of Jameson in before we hit the links. You know what I'm saying? But before I go do that, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about something that was on my mind this week, which is. This idea of manifestation, i.e. prayer is maybe another way of looking at it, limiting beliefs, um, also known as the law of attraction. There's abundance for scarcity. A lot of these things overlap in a lot of ways. A lot of these things are talked about in self-help circles. And I've had a varying degree of relationship with these thought processes or these ideas through the course of my life. Uh, a lot of them negative. I think they're a little bit beat to death by like the self-help and motivational space. I also think back to when I was younger, there was a book called The Secret, which is at the time was probably the most well-known publication based around the idea of the law of attraction or manifestation. It's this idea that essentially what you think about eventually leads to what you get. So if you're always thinking negative thoughts, you're going to get negative outcomes. And if you're always thinking positive thoughts, you will you'll get positive outcomes in your life. That's a very basic way of talking about it. But I got a little turned off because I remember, I think I dove into it when I was a teenager or something. I can't remember exactly when it came out. I want to say late nineties or early two thousands, but it was very popular at the time. And I got a little turned off to this whole genre of content simply because this secret was a little bit frou-frou. The authors, this female author, she dove into some kind of cosmological nonsense talking about universal energy and frequency and how your thoughts emit frequencies and the frequency goes out into the universe and then creates these results. And like that type of shit's a little bit too astrological bullshit for me. If any of you guys that have listened to my content or watched my videos over the years, you probably know that I'm pretty pragmatic. I'm not a very uh, esoteric or spiritual or like universe guy. I'm very just kind of like cold, hard pragmatism, like science, you know, just trying to make sense of it. So I've always looked at this stuff through a pretty skeptical lens. Throughout the course of my life, my my thoughts and ideas around the law of attraction and manifestation and this idea of your thoughts being the leader of what results you get in your life, um, my ideas around that school of thought have changed pretty drastically. And like I said, I think I always get a little bit worried when talking about this type of thing because it's easy to come across as some sort of Instagram guru, Tony Robbins type, where it's like the problem, you know, you just play some sort of motivational backing track and talk very coarsely and be like, the reason you're not getting what you want is limiting beliefs. 
And while there's a lot of truth to that phrase, probably, it just, it, it's impossible not to sound kind of cringe. <laughs> so I'm going to try to talk about it from my own experience and where I've settled in my ideas around the laws of attraction and this idea of manifestation and how where you spend most of your time with your thoughts can have such a incredible implication on the outcomes in your life. Uh, because I do, as a, as a general statement, I do, I do believe that um, quite wholeheartedly. So, you know, you think about, and I'll get to this later, but you know, a lot of times you hear this from prolific people in, in sports or just any, any type of person, whether it's an athlete or someone who's done something incredible. I think about the Kobe Bryant's, the Michael Jordan's Kobe specifically has talked a lot about this idea of visualization, which is the same thing, right? He would spend nights in bed, just visualizing himself in arenas and playing and shooting and scoring 80 points, a hundred points, and just every night falling asleep, thinking about this before his days of, of, of fame and success. And to the point where, you know, when, once you finally get to this place, all of a sudden it feels possible. A lot of the ideas around limiting beliefs, I think, cross over with the visualization piece where the more you visualize something being possible, the more likely you are to believe it to be a possibility. And there is a, an interesting part of that that can have a, a profound implication on the course of your life. And I think for me, like I always hated the idea of the secret or excuse me, just, I, I remember there being this one, there was this one, it was like a testimony, right? And it felt so, it felt so prosperity preacher esque in this manifestation thing where it's like, Oh, you just got to think and pray and whatever. And, and the Lord, the Lord will provide it. Don't get me wrong. Like you guys know, I'm pretty agnostic and I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not going to talk on religion today, but there's a lot of crossover between prayer and, and this idea of manifestation limiting beliefs, I think it's essentially the same process, just dressed up differently depending on your belief in spiritual higher powers or not, right? For anyone who's spiritual or, or religious, it would be like, oh, it's it's prayer and this idea of belief and faith. You have belief and faith in something, and I think that's a beautiful thing. I truly do. Aside from the fact of the theological piece, whether you believe that to be true or not, I think the idea of having faith and belief in something bigger than yourself or something beyond where you're, where you're at now, something that seems crazy or insane. The first step to, to getting to that next level in life is the belief that you, you can actually get there. I've had some experience with that particular type of thinking in my life, which I'll get to some examples in a moment, but there was this example, this testimony, I think it was, it could have been in the secret or some other book that was talking about this kind of law of attraction thing. And it was this woman who was like, I used to, you know, I went to bed every night praying to God or thinking whether it was praying or just thinking, visualizing my bank account and like all these, it's oftentimes it has to do with money problems. You know, this prosperity preachers, it's all about how you can, you can solve all your problems by the Lord blessing you with financial blessings. And she was like, yeah, yeah every night. And then one day I woke up and there was a $25,000 check in my mailbox. And I was like, shut the fuck up. So I had such a bitter taste in my mouth because it was like this idea that you could just think or pray and whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, blank checks would be showing up in your mailbox. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> like that's a big disconnect from A to B. Like maybe that was true, but there's clearly probably a B, C, D, E, and F that happened in between those things to get to the final destination of money showing up, showing up in your bank account. I've settled on this idea that your thoughts lead and those thoughts lead to your beliefs and those beliefs lead to your actions and your executions and those actions and executions lead to outcomes. So that was where there was always a disconnect for me where it's like, oh, you just have to believe or think about this thing and then boom, outcome. Well, no, the reality is your thoughts and your beliefs and your whatever your limiting beliefs or lack thereof, your faith, those things lead to different actions and executions, and that leads to outcomes. So I'll give you an example from my life. I was someone who grew up as a, a very heavy kid, which I've spoken about before, so I won't get into detail, but I was pretty big by the time I was like 
eight or nine years old, not only was I, you know, just a little bit heavy uh, as far as a, an obesity from the obesity, not only was I a little heavy from the obesity side of things, I was just a very large kid. I had a growth spurt very young. So I was just large for a kid. And as I got into high school and some kids caught up with me as far as like height and stuff like that, I just was always a little bit heavier. I weighed 262 pounds in seventh grade. I was a beast. And eventually I got into powerlifting and stuff in high school and have spent my whole life kind of reeling that in and turning it around and trying to find a balance that makes me healthy. But the idea is that I grew up heavy from a young age, so I always identified as the fat kid. I was always a kid that was fat. I was fatter than most other kids. And so that was a reality at the time, but that was also my belief about myself because it was true. And once you believe something about yourself, it, it's easy for it to become your identity. And so I think one of the hardest parts for people that struggle with certain aspects of their life that they don't love or that they want to change is that they've been a particular way for so long that they truly deep down believe this is who they are. And that belief becomes their identity. Okay. I'm the guy that can drink 30 beers at a party and I'm the life of the party. Oh, you're the party guy now. So now you start to believe that about yourself. And now there's this expectation that when you're on your friends, you always have to get pants shitting drunk because you're the guy that fucking gets ripped and is always funneling beers or whatever. Okay. Yeah. There's that. Then there's the person, it's the fat, the fat, funny guy, the Chris Farley's. That was me. I, that was my, that was my identity. My whole life was the fat, funny guy. And so I'm, I'm blessed in a lot of ways because I think I've that sense of humor that I've adopted and has carried me into my adult years honestly came from a necessity because I was so insecure. I wanted to find ways to get people to like me. And obviously there's different parts of personality and things you're born with and that you aren't. Um, but a lot of th that, that desire to like make people laugh and stuff comes from that insecurity around my identity is, is a fat kid, my insecurity around that. And so there's been this weird kind of tumult as an adult who's gotten in a little bit better shape. I still want to be funny, but it's like this idea I can't use, like there's such a, a physical comedy piece to people that are heavier that turns into their identity that if you're a co a comedian or a comic who is, has leaned on that for most of their life and all of a sudden you get in shape and you get healthy and you feel great, all of a sudden that part of your identity is gone and you have to shift and rethink how you're... <laughs> delivering your jokes or whatever. Anyways, that's a little bit of a tangent, but the idea is the point I'm trying to make is when you have a belief about yourself and that belief becomes part of your identity, it can be very hard to change that. Not because the actions you have to take are overtly difficult or impossible or insurmountable, like eating a little bit less or drinking a little bit less at parties if you're the party guy. No, but it's having to reconcile a change an identity that comes with taking a new course of action. Earlier in my life and my college years, like I've I've gone through the typical roller coaster of someone who was able to change my actions for a, a pretty elongated period of time, whether it was four or five months, and I was able to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds, get in shape, feel great about myself. But that belief, that internal belief of me being a fat kid never changed. It was always like, wow, this feels great. But I always in the back of my mind was like, well, it's, it, it can only be temporary because how can you, you know, I'm just, this is who I am. I'm the fat guy that makes people laugh. So once I got to a place where I was feeling better about myself, instead of being able to adopt this new identity, it was just slowly slipping back into that belief of myself and thoughts lead, actions follow. And it really took me until my honestly, in my thirties, the last five, six, seven, eight years, and more so recently where I've, I've, I've had some, what I think is success changing that part of my identity where I'm, you know, I'm not just the fat, funny guy. Now I, I can still be funny. I can make entertaining things. I can do stuff, make things that I'm proud of, but it doesn't have to be around that side of myself that is trying to entertain people to fill this this void in myself that comes from this insecurity of my, my appearance. Right. So that's a, that's been a lifelong battle for me in this idea that, Hey, you know what? You, you can be someone who lives a healthier lifestyle and still excel at these things that you tied to your former, that you, your former belief of yourself, your former identity. And so, you know, that's just an example from my life as far as uh, my, my, my lifelong 
kind of struggle with with weight. So whatever that thing might be for you, I guess what I've I've realized and what I think to be true is that you can always change yourself temporarily, but in order for a a seismic shift or a seismic change to stick and create a new lifestyle that requires not only the actions to get to that place, but the belief and the letting go of the former part of that identity. It's so much of what, you know what I mean? Like you could go down this rabbit hole about like alcoholism. And one of the first things they tell people that are struggling with addiction, whether it's drugs or alcohol or or whatever the addiction may be, it's you have to change your environment. Like you've, you've, you've been mingling in, in, in co, co, co-inhabiting spaces and your entire life has been around this group of friends that has, in, has not only enabled, but just been a part of this journey of you becoming this person that has been destructive and that you hate. And so in order to break away from that person and to find a new identity, it's sometimes imperative to leave that part of your life behind. And that can be the hardest part. It's not always the putting down the bottle or the needle or whatever it is, the fork, whatever, the fork. It is the company that you keep in this version of yourself, this belief of who you are in this life that you've created so far that is the hardest to break apart from. And if you can find yourself getting away from that and you're able to successfully break apart from that, belief of who you are, then your actions can start to follow and create a new identity for yourself. And this can be true for a lot of things in life. I mean, like I said before, this this idea of law of attraction, this manifestation, this thoughts leading into beliefs and these beliefs leading into actions, I really have started to think about a lot more as I've gotten older. And one of the other examples from my own life has been around financial prosperity and the idea of abundance versus scarcity mindset. That's another thing you've probably heard. Um, this abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset, meaning the more you think abundantly, the more abundance will come to you versus if you're constantly thinking scarcity and that there's not enough resources, oh, I have to pinch this and do that. There's never enough. You're just constantly worrying about never having enough. You're, you're always going to be dealing with never having enough. And that's a very general way to say it, but I do, I do truly believe there's a lot of truth behind that. Um, and speaking financially, like I think there's a big difference between being frugal and being cheap. I think being frugal can be good and healthy. I think being cheap is kind of synonymous with a scarcity mindset. In my life, I've had the good fortune and the blessing to be in a lot of different situations financially, some good and some bad. I've, I've faced financial ruin and not known how I'm going to pay for rent month to month. I've never been like homeless or poor or like had to sell the shirt off my back, but that type of situation makes you learn a lot about yourself and makes you get creative with how you're you're taking care of yourself and, and living your life. And, and I've also been on the other side of that where I've been blessed to have some financial success to the point where I'm not worried about how I'm going to pay for rent next month and I can go out to dinner without worrying about what my bank account's going to look like. Um, and I've seen everything in between. And without getting into... To too much detail, like, you know, it's the, the concept of money and finances on the internet and YouTube is really kind of skewed the way I think some people view money with people like Mr. Beast giving away $500,000 every video and all this stuff. But I'm by no means a massively successful YouTuber that's out here buying Lambos. But my definition of success has always been the fact that I've been able to take back my time by not having to work for someone else. And I'm in a position where I'm able to do something that I love and support my family. And that's always been my definition of success. And obviously I have my own personal goals. Um, but the main thing for me is just the fact that I have the freedom and I have the time I can be around my family. I can be with my son when I want, I don't have to worry about putting in for vacation days to try and, you know, I mean, there was 15 years. I can remember I always had to choose which holiday I wanted off to see my family because I always had to work the other ones. And so something I struggled with throughout the course of all of that was this this kind of abundance for scarcity mindset. Because when you go through periods in your life where things are scarce, it's easy to let that overwhelm you. And one of the things that helped me through that was just being in the restaurant industry. I've always had an abundance mindset around gratuity and just people in general. So while I've always been pretty frugal around materialism and buying things 
you know, spending money on cars, clothes. I'd go years without buying new clothes, you know, designer that I always thought, you know, just anything that was like a, like a, a status signal always felt so frivolous and stupid to me and still does for the most part. But when it comes to people and your behavior around people, like going out, like I can always remember times in my twenties where I, I barely had two nickels to rub together. But if you're out with your friends and you're having a good time, like go up, buy a round of drinks, you know, take care of a dinner amongst you and your friends, like something like who knows how you're going to take care of it. But it's this mindset that like, Hey, if you put out this good energy, you put out this abundance into the world. You're not constantly worried about every single little penny. You're not pinching this. You're not pinching that. That might eventually come back to you. And I don't know, again, I'm not like a believer of like these energies and the wavelengths of the universe, but there is an element of like getting back what you put in. And I think specifically when it comes to social settings and being around other people, you don't have to be negligent but there's nothing that somebody dislikes more than that person that's like at a table of four people. Say you're out with your friends. It's like four of you. You're all out to dinner. You're going to split it four ways. No problem. And it's like, all right, one person had one more drink than the other person. Uh, maybe your entree was 15 less dollars or something. Just split it four ways evenly. You're all out. You're paying for the experience to be out together having a good time. If you're that person that's like, well, I just, I need a separate bill because my shit was $10 less. Like, look, I get it. Money's tight. It's hard. You, you don't have a lot of it, but like th this is the mindset that leads to just a life of scarcity because you're always thinking like that. You have to have some sort of faith and belief in yourself that I'm not going to worry about this right now because I know that if I can start thinking more abundantly and I can put some good energy out into the universe in a way that just makes life easier for other people, that's going to come back to me. And that was pretty much all of my 20s. I was... I always had an abundance mindset around social gatherings and just things that matter to me, experiences with other people. I had a frugal mindset around materialism and things I knew weren't going to provide my life value, but I've always thought that spending money on valuable experiences with people is always worth it. And I still believe that to this day. And I have no problem spent like I will spend days researching the difference between a particular product that I need so I can maybe save $20 on a better version of something that costs $200, but I have no problem spending five, six, seven hundred dollars to have the best night of my life with some of my friends at like a concert and going out afterwards having a good time. And it did, it worked. Like back then I had no fucking clue. I'd go, I'd have weekends where we'd go, I'd do things and it would be, I'm like, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen at the end of this weekend. I'm going to wake up on Monday and look at my bank account and have a mild aneurysm, but I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. And I kept that mindset through my twenties and it, it, I feel like that paid off. That kind of ties back into the, the law of attraction and this limiting beliefs. I had faith in myself early on that I was going to be able to figure something out. I didn't know what it was, but I was never like, oh, I'm always going to be stuck in this position. I'm always going to be worrying about how to pay rent. I'm never going to be, you know, I'm just going to be working in the restaurant. Like I have to pin, I have to look at every dollar and every line item and I can't have fun and I can't do this. Like, cause oh, just financial ruin. Right? No, it was the opposite of that. It was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm in a tough spot right now, but I got faith in myself. I know I have abilities. I have a good heart. And I know that generosity is going to come back to me in spades. If I can just adopt a mindset that is generous and abundant. And you know, now, however, what 15 years later, it's like, it fucking worked. And I don't know how it worked. I worked hard. I busted my balls. Like, this is the thing. It's not about like just believing something and it happening. It's like, no, it's like when you believe these things, when you have faith in yourself and you have faith in your abilities, that leads to actions and executions that create results. But those actions and those executions don't happen unless you first have the belief in the thoughts that you're, you're able to do those things. I think a lot about the crossover between this idea of the law of attraction, which is, feels like a very secular form of prayer, basically. And looking at it pragmatically from a secular viewpoint, prayer feels a lot like this idea of just removing limiting beliefs and having faith and belief in the ability for something for, to happen. And the difference with prayer and religion is you're, you're not believing in yourself and your own abilities as much as you are giving up, or I shouldn't say giving up, you are giving that problem, you are giving it to God, as someone might say. You are praying, you are believing 
that you alone don't have the strength or the ability to get this outcome. So you're giving it to God. And sometimes God delivers. And it's kind of the same idea for me, at least the way I think about it. It's like, oh, if you just believe and pray hard enough, a $25,000 check shows up in your mailbox. It's like, well, no. Most of the time when people pray and believe in faith and they give things to God, they're doing things, their actions in the meantime are indicative of somebody who wants that result. And oftentimes when that result happens, God is good. God has provided. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. That's certainly one way to look at it. But also your behavior for the last three months, three years, 10 years has directly led to these results as well. <laughs> so, so I've always found it very interesting and I'm not trying to discredit anyone who believes in the power of prayer. And, and obviously like this is a wonderful thing. My, my entire family, like this is, this is, this is their mindset. This is what they believe. They believe that our problems, we give them to God and he, there, he will do with them what he will. And he knows everything. He knows us inside and out and he will provide for us. To me, that this idea of like manifestation and the law of attraction and th your thoughts leading your actions, leading to your results is, is kind of like the secular version of prayer. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, whatever, whatever it is for you. And this is why, you know, and I've said this before in my conversations where I've spoken briefly about my current beliefs and thoughts on spirituality and religion where I'm, I'm relatively agnostic. I have, I see the value in it. I struggle with the actual belief of the theology of, of a lot of it, but I do see the value in the belief in the faith side of it. Certainly. So I think for a lot of people, even if you are, are secular and you're not very religious and you're not into prayer and this idea of giving your problems to God, et cetera, I think that framework makes a lot of sense because there is such a, I think there's something so powerful about being able to truly allow yourself to believe something is possible before that thing can actually happen. Once you have a little practice doing that, you know, start small, start small with something to be like, Hey, this, there's no reason I can't change this part of my life. Like I've just been waking up every day for 10 years being like, this is how it is. This is how it is. Life's so hard. This is, uh, you know, every single day, it's a new problem. It's a new health issue. It's whatever. It's like all of your energy is being spent thinking about the negative. There's no way you're ever going to find a way out of that without a giant shift of mindset in belief structure. And I'm not like the fruit fruit. Like, it's not like, oh, you know, it, it, with if, if you can believe it, you can achieve it. Like there's so many memes and so much bullshit around like, yeah, like there's obviously limitations to what people can do. Certain people are smart. Certain people are dumb. Certain people are super intelligent, high IQ. Certain people have incredible athletic ability. Like I'm not just going to wake up tomorrow and be like, I believe I can be an NBA athlete. As an almost 40-year-old man, I'm going to fall asleep every night and believe that I can make it to the NBA. Like there needs to be a heavy dose of realism within this. But at the same time, there is a beautiful serendipity in this idea that you, most people could achieve pretty much anything they want within reason if they were just able to bring themselves to believe it was possible. And I use within reason judiciously there. And how do you implement that in your life? I, I don't know. I think there's, there's a lot of ways you can start to implement ways to change your thought process. The first is self-awareness. It's a self-awareness about your self-talk, about your inner voice, about how you're constantly talking to yourself. It's about how you think about yourself. It's about your routines. It's about your daily habits. It's about proof. It's about, you know, like doing something for enough amount of time where it's like, Hey, I can do this. And then you start to believe like, that's why habits are so important when it comes to this type of thing. It's like, well, you don't, I don't believe I can drop 20 pounds or I don't believe I can bench press 225. It's like, well, wake up three days a week, go for a quick walk and then lift weights for six months. And once that habit builds and all of the sudden you start to see some changes. Now, now you start to believe it's possible to get there because you've seen that change. And once you believe it, then it's like, then there's nothing that can possibly stop you. Once you believe that you can do it, a lot of stuff that's crazy and feels very lofty. It's like, you're starting, you're poking around, you're starting to try it. Like 
like for me, I remember back and I've, I've told this story before and I'll tell it again right now. Cause maybe you haven't heard it, but now, I don't even know if I've told it publicly, maybe once on the Lush Life channel, but this is back to a financial piece. This was a belief thing. And again, this was before I had never seen more than maybe like three or $4,000 in my bank account in my entire life. I was in my mid to late twenties and I just had no idea. I had no belief or idea of what it would be like to have any sort of uh, financial prosperity. I couldn't, couldn't imagine what it was like. I was, I always knew like I was working at something, like I was in a band. I knew I didn't want to work nine to five. So I was in a restaurant. I was being creative. I was making music. I was trying to do something that could eventually lead to a life where I was be able to self-sustain while doing something I love. That was always the goal for me. And I went to take out money from an ATM at TD Bank back when I lived outside of the Boston, just outside of the city in a suburb. And I walked into the ATM and there was a receipt hanging out of the ATM. And I pulled the receipt out. I don't know why. And it said it was a 10th. It was like a, it was like a $1,000 withdrawal. And the receipt said remaining balance, $110,000. And it was the first time I'd ever seen a bank receipt with a six figure number on it. And it really like it, it was this weird moment for me because it was like this tangible receipt. I knew that like in 10 minutes I was going to get the same receipt after I took out, you know, 60 bucks and it would say remaining balance, like $1,600 or whatever. So the only thing I'd ever seen my whole life, the only thing I knew, the only thing I was used to. And there was this weird moment where I saw it. It was like this visualization. I saw this receipt said $110,000 remaining. And I just pictured that being my receipt. I was like, holy fuck. I was like, imagine what it would be like to have six figures in your bank. Like the freedom. I can't even imagine what that would feel like. Like, But for the first time in my life, in that moment, I was imagining what it would feel like. And this weird sensation came over me. I was like, I was like, oh my goodness. I, and it's it's really tough to explain in hindsight. This was over a decade ago. This was maybe, this was maybe 12, maybe, maybe 11, 12, 13 years ago. So I took that receipt, a TD bank receipt. I didn't know who the fuck it was. There's no name on it. Just said that, you know, the last four digits of the account number. And I taped it to my computer monitor. And every day I sat down when I started to do the YouTube thing and I started to learn how to edit and all these back before I had any sort of business online. And I was like trying to figure out what to do. Every day I sat down at my computer, I would look at that bank receipt and be like, that's, that's probably, that's possible. Like someone else has done that. Why can't I do that? And I'll never forget the day when my, I guess you would call net worth or your bank, whatever it was like cross the six figure mark. And I was like, I just looked at that receipt and I was just so overwhelmed with kind of like this weird sense of gratitude and humility and, and almost like this, like a, a sad, I, I don't, it was a weird feeling, but I was like, man, that was, I wonder, I do wonder if that finding that receipt in that ATM that day actually played a role in enabling my beliefs to start taking the actions to get to that place. And that has had such a profound effect on my life. And I get like, I, I get, it gives me the chills sometimes thinking about it because there are so, I just think there's so many people that are being so held back by their own internal value systems and their own internal limiting beliefs that they're li like, that all they need is that, all they need is that ATM receipt that I had, you know, something like that to happen in their life to be like, Hey, this can change. It can, like, it can absolutely be different. You just have to first believe that it's possible. And then slowly your actions and your executions can start matriculating to a place where that eventual outcome becomes a reality. It can be financial. It can be health related. It can be, it can truly be anything. And I don't know who that person was, whose receipt that was, but that is something, you know, this is one of those stories that I will remember for the rest of my life. I will take to my grave and I don't have a lot of crazy memories, but something about that moment where I was just in such desperation and so hungry for like something different than what was my current life. And it just felt like this turning point and this, you know, and in that moment, it still feels insurmountable, but through, through enough time and enough small little decisions day to day, whatever that was and enough repetition, sitting down at the computer and looking out of the corner of my eye at that fucking receipt, $110,000 bank balance. It just subconsciously imprinted in my brain that, Hey, what, 
Why can't that be mine? Why can't that be my receipt? I don't know what the moral of that story was. I didn't, when I started making this podcast, I hadn't even thought of that story, but it, it all kind of ties in pretty well because even if I didn't want to admit it back then, that was kind of a, a manifestation story for me. It was like, hey, here's the thing. Here's this thing that I know is possible. I just need to believe that it's possible. And then what do you know? It becomes reality. So I'm not sure what that looks like for you right now or where you're at in your life, but I do know that there is a incredible incredible value to just the self-awareness to start to know that if you start to retrain the way you think about certain things, it can lead to incredible outcomes. And when you start to retrain how you think about certain things and retrain how you view yourself and retrain how you view what's possible, that can inadvertently lead to different behaviors, right? That's what it is. Like we all know the behaviors it takes to get a certain outcome but you're never going to start making that behavioral change unless you first believe the outcome to be possible. So I want to end here real quick. You know, I, I think a lot about the Michael Jordans and the Kobe Bryants, people that are the best at what they do. And, um, and I spoke earlier in the podcast about Kobe and how he visualized things. And I know a lot of athletes, a lot of athletes, a lot of uh, musicians, people they talk about, like, you know, they would, they're writing songs in their closet playing in bars to 13 people. And it's like, they'd go home at night and just sit on their bed and just lie down and think about what it was like to play to a stadium, picture themselves in front of an audience of 50,000 playing the songs that they wrote. You're just, you're putting it through your mind. And there is, again, um, I don't believe in this kind of like cosmological bullshit energy, whatever, but I do believe in the indisputable power of the mind. The mind is the epicenter of everything. It is powerful and whatever you believe, whether it's God or whatever it is, your brain is the epicenter of human life, generally. Certainly we have the, you know, the the carts, the parts of the car, the heart and the lungs, all these things that make sense, but the brain is where it all happens. And there is something about your ability to train and be deliberate with how you utilize your brain's power through the way you think and the way you talk and the way you think about yourself and the way you view yourself and the way you view your potential and these things that you believe that is, is so, it is such a prerequisite for the eventual outcome that you were trying to have. And so that is a beautiful starting point. Um, and just wanted to play this clip real quick from Kobe. Um, it's only a minute long, just as we kind of end this here. You know, like sometimes you lay down in bed and you visualize things and you just kind of, you know, just, you know, that's how. That's at least how I would go to sleep. I'd lay down. And I'd imagine playing for the Lakers, and I'd imagine what the uniforms look like. I'd imagine where we'd be playing, and you know, the smell of the arena and all sorts of stuff. And I would see myself, you know, getting hot, you know, and you know, score ten straight points. And then, but in the dream, like, why would you ever interrupt that? Like, you're not going to have a dream and be like, okay, and then he misses his next six. Like, it's not going to happen. So you just keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming. And before I sleep, I'm like at 120 points, you know, and so. And so when you grow up, downloading that into your brain over and over and over. So when you download that into your system and you go out in the, on the, in the court and you're just executing things that you've done thousands of times before and you have that dream, then that becomes possible.